I want to give a welcome to you tonight, especially to my live audience here in the great city of Los Angeles in California, the United States of America. A special greeting to our friends in Great Britain, Australia, and also New Zealand. And how could we forget our friends in India? So special welcome to every person tonight and our friends right across this great land of the United States of America. Tonight's message, how to live the good life. Remember Pete Wilson, who was the governor of the great state of California? Have you heard the story how he was visiting a home for the aged? Uh, we call them senior citizens. And he was, uh, I guess he was running for <laughs> re-election or something. And he came upon a little old lady and she had white hair. God bless her. Nothing wrong with white hair, folks. <laughs> she had white hair and she was sweet. Well, now I'm going to push this one. And she was sweet, white hair. She was walking unaided. She used to go shopping to the mall. And she looked remarkable. He said to her, did the governor, what is the secret of your life? She said, I'm a vegetarian. I eat tofu. I've gone to John Carter's meetings. I drink soy milk from Trader Joe's. And when it's on special, I get it from Costco. I walk at least three miles a day. I read my Bible. I pray. How old are you, dear? She said, I'm 105 years old. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank God for tofu, 105. <laughs> Thank God for these meetings. Then there was an old gentleman. He had white hair. He, uh, he was sweet. He was nice. What is the secret of your success, sir? Said the governor running for re-election. He said, the old gentleman said, I don't worry. I don't fret. I don't complain. <clears throat> I love my family. I love to travel. And I swim uh, every morning. I swim a, a mile every morning. Amazing, said the governor. How old are you? He said, I'm 102. You know, these tough old Americans, these tough old Californians, <clears throat> these folks didn't even live in the Loma Linda area. Then he stopped by a really old man. This man had white hair, but he had, um, he had no teeth. Oh, I think he had one tooth. <laughs> this is not actually the man, but this is a man that they found up the back. <laughs> but this man will do. When you're desperate to find an illustration, you'll pick anyone. This man was stooped, he was shaky, he was irritable and cranky. He was mean. Governor Wilson said, you must be the oldest. He said to this man, what's your secret, sir? He said, well, I, I worry a lot. I drink a lot. I gamble. I have no exercise plan at all. I eat what I like, when I like. And I've had seven marriages. And he said, how old are you, sir? He said, I'm 35. <laughs> Now, the purpose of this lecture, and you know it's good to laugh, that's called internal jogging. The purpose of this lecture is to share inspired information that will impart to you quality and quantity of years. The quality and the quantity of your years are, with a few notable exceptions, determined by your lifestyle, what you believe and how you live. Abraham Lincoln, that great president of the United States of America, remarked, a man is about as happy as he chooses to be. Happiness is a choice. He's also about as healthy as he chooses to be. 
Now, the purpose of this meeting, listen, all of you folks, is to explain the scientific, spiritual, physical, psychological, dynamic health laws of the Bible. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 10 and verse 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And you can see the text right here in this building. We've got enough light here for you to see. John chapter 10 and verse 10. Times may be tough, but we haven't turned off all the lights yet. John chapter 10 and verse 10. If you got the text, in this edition, it's page 1666. John 10 verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, there are many, many thieves and there are many, many robbers and they take from us the quality of life that God wants us to have. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life in the King James Version and have it more abundantly. I want you to turn now to the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse uh, chapter 40 to my Australian friends. That's the book of Isaiah. Isaiah or here in America, it's the same part of the Bible. Isaiah 40, verse 30 and 31. This is one of the most wonderful texts in the Bible. I absolutely love this text. Isaiah 40 and verse 30 and 31. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, what does it say? Will renew their strength. Now say it with me. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. What a superlative text. What a fat text. God says those who trust in God will renew their strength. And then the Bible tells us something wonderful. The Bible says those who trust in God are going to soar on wings like eagles. That's one of the most wonderful, one of the most blessed texts in the Bible. Let me ask you something. Have you ever watched an eagle as he soars? I've got a property out in Australia at a place called Terra Nora in North New South Wales. It looks out over a great river, the Tweed River, that winds down to the mighty Pacific Ocean. And from the front veranda, you can see about 30 miles of ocean. You can see the waves breaking in the distance. And right at the bottom of the property, there is a rainforest. Oh, goodness. It's a wonderful rainforest. It is so thick, it's hard to fight your way through it. But when you stand on the veranda of my place, often you'll look up into the sky and there over the river and over the escarpment, over the, the rainforest, you'll see eagles. And you'll see them get in those wind updrafts and you'll see them go up and up and up until you can hardly see them. And the Bible says, those who get to know God and follow the teachings of His Word are going to soar on wings like eagles. And Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. God wants you to rise above the foggy, smoggy lowlands. I want you to come now, my friend, over here to the book of Proverbs because tonight we're going to talk about wisdom. Come over here to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 13 and onwards. In this edition, it's page 988. This is the Bible we're giving to you. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 13 to 18. The Bible says, Blessed or happy, blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. 
That's beautiful. She's more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Look at these words now, because these words are so important. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. The Bible tells us that if you and I can get wisdom, we are going to find the tree of life and we're going to live longer and we're going to enjoy life to the full. What is wisdom? Wisdom is far more than knowledge. Now today, the world is full of knowledge. So often today, our heads are full of knowledge, but our hearts are empty. It's true, isn't it? Now, the Bible tells us we need to seek wisdom, the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the deep, insightful application of knowledge. Information is not enough. But the Bible tells us that if we will seek God and seek His wisdom, we are going to be blessed and we are going to be fruitful, and we're going to be happy. I want you to notice now the wisdom of the Bible, the biblical concept of man. Would you come over here to Luke chapter 2 and verse 52? The words of Jesus, the biblical concept of man. Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. In this edition, page 1593. Jesus, it's speaking of Jesus, it says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now the Bible tells me that man is made up of four important parts. Listen to it. I'll read the text again. I want you to think about this. Jesus grew firstly in wisdom and we're going to put that on the blackboard. Firstly, the first part of man is the mental. And the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom. This is talking about the mental. And then the text goes on to say, and I'm going to read it again so it'll sink down into the molecules of our minds. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. And this is talking, the stature, it is talking about the physical and that is tremendously important. And maybe we're going to emphasize that tonight. Jesus grew mentally. He grew physically. And the Bible says, in favor with God. And this is talking about the spiritual. Now, many people, perhaps most people, ignore this. In favor with God. And it says, also in favor with man. And this is talking about the social. And if a person wants to be a balanced individual, if a person wants to be strong, and if a person wants to have the wisdom from God so that he can find the path of life, he must develop firstly the mental and then the physical, all of it together. They all work together. The mental, the physical, the spiritual, and the social. Would you like to know why many so-called cures fail? People go to doctors and the doctor treats them and he treats the physical part and they don't seem to get any better. It is often because the mind is so negative that the body cannot recover because of the negativity in the mind. Or maybe because the spiritual is gone, the person has got no faith and the person has got no hope. And sometimes it is because of the social or partly because of the social. The person is by himself and he doesn't have any relationship with other people. But the Bible tells me that if we're going to be healed, we have to be healed as a complete person. And this tells us why so many uh, medical approaches today fail. There's a new approach today being carried out in great American university hospitals and they're leading the world in this. In hospitals, 
that for so long have simply talked about the physical. They're now bringing in ministers and the ministers are praying for the patients. And before the doctors will carry out surgery, they'll have the chaplain come in and the chaplain will put his hand on the patient and the doctors will stand there and they'll bow their heads because the scientific community is waking up to the fact that man is more than simply the physical. Man has got a spiritual side. And they have discovered that patients who are prayed for and patients who pray themselves recover much faster than other patients. And they've discovered that people who pray to God and have faith in God get sick far less frequently. You see, we are more than simply a body. The Bible wants us to soar on wings like eagles. In the United States of America today and in other parts of the world, but especially here because this is where we live, there's a great health crisis. Health costs are almost out of control. Politicians say, what on earth are we going to do? It's going to break the country. We have a tremendous deficit. And one of the biggest problems is the soaring costs of keeping people alive, the great health crisis. I want to illustrate it by this. I want you to think of eight jumbo jets. And those eight jumbo jets crash every day. If we had one jumbo jet crash a year in the United States of America, we would consider it to be a crisis and a great catastrophe. But every day in the United States of America, the equivalent of eight jumbo jets crash. They're the number of people who have heart attacks. And of the, of the victims in those eight jumbo jets, half are killed straight away. Some recover and some make a good recovery, but other people have terrible suffering and terrible pain. Eight jumbo jets every day crash. Then I want you to think of lung cancer. And this can be avoided largely. I want you to think that three jumbo jets crash daily. And unlike the heart attack victims, there are no survivors. 1,000 citizens of the United States of America die daily because they smoke. What a curse it is. What a curse it is. We've seen the ads we don't see them so frequently today. And it talks about Marlborough country. And it talks about the Marlborough man. Don't you remember those ads? They stopped those ads. You know why? The Marlborough man died of cancer. He died of cancer. Three jumbo jets crash every day in the United States loaded with people who are dying of lung cancer because they've been smoking. What a health crisis. Then we have an epidemic of cancer, diabetes, alcoholism, obesity, and mental illness. And therefore today, there is a crisis in America and people say, what on earth can we do? Let me tell you, get wisdom. The Bible says, find wisdom. Because if you get wisdom, it is the tree of life. All her paths are paths of pleasantness. We're going to talk about some of this wisdom tonight. Listen to this statement. Almost all this pain, suffering, and premature death, I say 
almost, not all, almost all this pain, suffering, and premature death can be avoided if we learn wisdom. And tonight we're going to share with you some of the wisdom that's found in the Bible. I want you to come over here to Exodus 15 and verse 26, dear hearts and gentle people. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. Here God is talking to his people. Exodus 15 and we're going to go to verse 26. It's page 111 in this edition of the New International Version. He said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord. What does it say? The Lord who heals you. God says, if you obey my word, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that the Egyptians got. And God says, if you learn the wisdom of God, I will heal you. I want to tell you folks something tonight. And, and this is absolutely true. This information that you're receiving tonight is worth more than a million dollars for every one of you. Worth more than $10 million. Worth more than a billion dollars because what will a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses himself? And so tonight, God wants us to soar on wings like eagles. And wisdom is the key. I want you to come now to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24. These uh, books here were written by Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24. It's page 285 in this edition of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. God says, if you will obey my word and keep my commandments, then you are going to prosper. Come out to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verses 1 down to 8. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 down to 8. The Bible says, God says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Now these, these are tremendous words. These are powerful words. Then it goes on to say, you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trowel will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and you'll be blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. So the Bible says here, right here, the Bible says that God is going to bless you. He's going to bless you so much that you won't be able to take in all of these tremendous blessings that God has for you. So I want you to see tonight I want you to get this in your hearts. If you and I will learn wisdom and follow the word of God and obey his word, we're going to soar on wings like eagles and we will be so happy and we will be so glad that we follow the word of God. And Jesus said, I've come so that you will have life and have it 
to the full. Now try this text over here. Leviticus chapter 3 and verse 17. Leviticus chapter 3 and verse 17. Now this is one of the health laws of the Bible and it talks about eating fatty foods. And this text is about three and a half thousand years old. Leviticus chapter 3 and verse 17. You got it? This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Wherever you live, you must not eat any fat or any blood. Now here is a text that is three and a half thousand years old in the Bible. And the Bible says you're not to eat any fat and you're not to eat any blood. Experts now agree. There's no debate about this anymore. All of the experts say, we now know what is the truth in this matter. Four types of fat. Monounsaturated fats. That's the best. Number two, polyunsaturated fats. Number three, saturated fats such as you find in flesh foods. And then I'm going to say it in a special way. Hydrogen aided. Hydrogenated? No. Let me say it this other way because it tells you what's really there. Because when you say hydrogenated, you don't really get the meaning. Hydrogen aided. Saturated fat is the stuff that you find in meat. That is the stuff that clags the arteries. That's probably the main cause of heart disease and cancer. Can it be prevented? Yeah, largely. What's this other thing? This hydrogen. This hydrogenated stuff. This high. What's that stuff? What they do. I wanted to say it with this hydrogen way because they push hydrogen through the atoms. And this stabilizes the product. If it's a margarine or something else, they push it through, or soy protein, they push it through, and it puts a different type of texture there. It makes it taste better and better still, it makes it last longer on the shelf. So they make more money out of it. If you keep pushing the hydrogen through the atoms, do you know what you get? Plastic. I want you to get some wisdom. And the next time you go shopping, read down the side of the product you're buying It is man-made to make the product last longer and taste better. It is in almost all of the cakes and stuff that you buy. It is a deadly poison. Let me ask you a question. What do you think drives business here in the United States of America? What do you think really is the driving force behind business? Hmm? Do you think it's because they like us? <laughs> Come on, answer me back. What's the driving force behind business? Money. Money. They don't care whether you get cancer or heart disease as long as they make a buck. What we need is some wisdom. And when you read the label, sometimes you'll see all of these long chemical names. Have you seen that? Maybe it's in some product you get, you take home and feed it to your kids, and you've got a list this long, and it's got tiny little writing, and these long chemical words. Let me tell you folks, something. if you can't pronounce it, you shouldn't eat it. 
If you can't pronounce it, you shouldn't eat it. <laughs> it's poison, it's junk, it's garbage. And you know why they're doing it? Not because I like you. They want money. We need to smarten up. We need to be smarter than these people. I want to show you something over here. This is really important that you see this text. I want you to come to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29. It tells us the original Genesis diet. Genesis 1 and verse 29. Genesis 1 verse 29. Ready? Then God said... I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. When God made man, he made him to live for eternity. God knew what was best for my system. When I buy a new car, and I won't be buying one for a while now, but if you, when you buy a new car, what I normally do for the first 10 minutes, I get out the manual. It's this thick. <laughs> and I check the oil and when it's got to be serviced. But I find out what sort of fuel to put in it. I want to make sure I'm putting the right gas in it, and I want to make sure I'm putting the best uh, synthetic oil. Mobile one or something like that. I want to know the right sort of stuff to put in so my car is going to last. God gave us a diet and that diet consisted of grains, fruits, nuts and vegetables. Going to put this over here on the blackboard. Now, you may say, well, you know, this is, this is sort of revolutionary. Yeah, yes, it is. It's breaking with the pack. It's not allowing yourself to be manipulated anymore. So here it is. God gave our first parents grains, fruits, nuts, and probably the best nuts you can get are almonds, which are high in protein and monounsaturated fats. Every person ought to have at least a, a handful of almonds every day because it's good for you. Grains, fruits, nuts, and uh, vegetables. And the best vegetables are the leafy green vegetables. And all of these things are anti-cancer foods. Anti-heart disease foods. Anti-dying foods. You've heard of the Mediterranean diet? I got a great doctor. In fact, I got a number of doctors. They're all Jewish doctors. They're all my dear friends. Dr. Jack Kindy, I think about the best doctor I've found anywhere. He's out at Agoura Hills. Don't go to see him because it's too hard to get in to see him. <laughs> but he's just, well, go and see him. He's a great doctor if you can get in to see him. He said to me over and over again, we now know that the Western diet is about the worst diet in the world. The American diet is just killing people like crazy. That's why we got this stupid health crisis. We've done it to ourselves. That's what he said. And it's true. And he said, there's the Mediterranean diet. He said, the people who live in those areas, the Mediterranean areas, they have heaps of grains and they've got lots of fruits and they've got lots of vegetables and uh, I would say, if you're talking about nuts, you're looking at one up there now. Mm. But people who live on a Mediterranean diet that's rich in all of these things over here, those people only get a fraction of the diseases that we get. Red meats cause cancer. You say, how do you know? It is a scientific fact. Well, why doesn't the government tell us? Hey, are they going to lose all the votes? They're not going to tell you anything that's going to cause them to lose votes. They'll tell you what you want to hear so you'll vote for them. They'll build a bridge to nowhere to get your votes. So if you eat a lot of red meat, 
the odds are you're going to get cancer of the bowel. Also, they pump the animals with hormones to make them grow fast. Most of those poor little old cows never get out of their little pens. They never see the light of day and they pump them up with hormones and then they fill them up with antibiotics because they're full of disease. They're rotting with disease. So they fill them up with antibiotics and you eat the antibiotics and when you go to the doctor and he gives you an antibiotic, it doesn't work for you. You know why? Because you got so much of it in the meat and in the milk. You say, is this true? Hey, go check it up on the internet. Yes, absolutely. It is the truth. Have you seen and heard, have you heard the sit and sleep commercials? Sit and sleep? I get them on KNX 1070 all the time when I drive into the office. You know, this is the guy who's selling these wonderful mattresses and he's selling them, of course, uh, cheaper than anybody else can buy a mattress in the whole of America. And he has an accountant. Have you heard the commercials? He's got an accountant and uh, the accountant says, you're killing me, Larry. <laughs> and the other guy says, you know, if you can find a better price, we'll give it to you, you know, or your mattress is free. You know how he goes like this? You hear these commercials? They've done it again, that commercial. You know how it goes now? They have, they have a choir singing. Or your mattress is free. You know, <laughs> but the original commercial is the best. Your mattress is free, he goes. And the accountant says, you're killing me, Larry. Mm. You're killing me. We're killing ourselves. We're killing our kids. We need wisdom from God. Dr. Alabaster, a famous scientist, said, it's no secret that the modern American diet is mostly bad and getting worse. And that's true for the British and the Australians and the New Zealanders and uh, most of the Western countries where cancer and heart disease, they're out of control. The main cause of cancer, not the only cause, but the main cause of cancer, heart disease and diabetes is what we eat. We certainly do dig our graves with our teeth. I visited, uh, I visited Africa on, on a number of occasions. I went into the cities and then I went out in the villages. The people in the cities have got the same diseases that we have. You know why? We've sent to them our fast foods. So over there you can get the Big Mac and the Whopper and all of those things. And the hospitals are full of people with heart disease and, and cancer. That's a fact. In African cities, they're as sick as we are. But you go out into the villages where the people are poor. And you know what they eat? Grains and fruits and vegetables and big green leafy vegetables, these whopping big things. I have a friend who was a doctor there as a missionary for many, many years in Africa and he never saw in the villages a case of cancer, of heart disease, of obesity, diabetes, or any of those things that are killing us. Remember the commercial? You're killing me, Larry. Just remember, what drives America? The dollar. Of course it does. Come over here to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. The Bible says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Your body belongs to God. Be careful what you do with it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 
Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Hey, glad I never wrote that. The Bible says that this body is the temple of God. This is where the Spirit of God dwells. And the Bible says we are to glorify God in our body. And the Bible says, if I destroy the temple of God, God will destroy me. So this is important stuff. Because the body is the temple of God, we should do everything to look after the body. I strongly advocate exercise. I practice what I preach. I got a naughty track machine. I use it for 30 minutes a day. It's a hard workout. I try to walk four miles a day. Every person sitting here in this great auditorium, if you're not walking three or four miles a day, The time you're saving in not walking is the time you're going to spend being sick. So your body is the temple of God. I think of tobacco. It is a sure killer. I think of a man who came to my meetings in Canberra. He never came into the meetings. He used to drop his wife off. She came into the meetings. I was asked to go and visit him. He was the Marlborough man for that part of the world. I went to visit him. He was dying of lung cancer. Have you ever seen a man die of lung cancer? I don't recommend it. I don't recommend such a death. I took his funeral and the people from the tobacco industry came in and filled the church and they stood around the side of the church to honor the man that their product had murdered. And then when the service was over, they all got outside and the first thing they did, they lit up. I say, how crazy can you get? Your body is the temple of God. And God says, if you destroy that body, I will destroy you. Now this is the wisdom of God. I'm telling you this because I love you and because I care for you. You're not paying me to tell you something that you want to hear. I'm not being paid to run a popularity contest so that you're going to like me. I want you to be saved. I want you to be happy. I want you to be healthy. Let's talk for a little bit about the biggest drug in North America It's the drug that Congress and the Senate and the White House will not touch. And it's the biggest drug in North America. You know what it is? Come over here to Proverbs 20 and verse 1. It tells you, the biggest drug in North America that Congress won't talk about or the Senate, or the White House. Nobody will talk about it. Why? Because these verses tell you why. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. And then if you come over here to chapter 23, and 29 to 32. 23. 29 to 32, the Bible says, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaints, who has needless bruises, who has bloodshot eyes, those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Now I know that I'm in a minority, but did you know this? 
that there are millions of people tonight who are suffering and going through lives of hell because of the demon in the bottle. In my property in Australia, I was standing on the veranda there a bit over a year ago. It's in virgin country. It's just been built. And so people haven't lived there. And I saw a tremendous king brown snake come up the lawn. He was about this high, about this thick. I've never seen a, a snake like it. One of the most deadly snakes in the world. Australia's got the most poisonous snakes in the world. The Bible says the wine that you're drinking is like a poisonous snake and it's going to kill you. I personally do not touch alcohol. And no person who belongs to my church touches alcohol because we believe it is the worst drug in North America. We believe it's the biggest curse. There was a man on death row. You know why he was there? He was there because he'd, he'd murdered his mother. And a friend of mine went to see him. He said, boy, he was only a young man. Why did you do this? He said, I came home, I was so drunk and my mother was waiting for me in the kitchen and she started to nag, 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 nag. He said, in my blind fury, I went and got a kitchen knife and killed her. He killed his own mother because he was drunk. And my friend, the doctor said to him, son, would you mind telling me, who gave you your first drink? You know what he said? My mother. Wine is a marker. Strong drink is raging. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Who gave you your first drink? There are around 15 million alcoholics in this great country. I don't think anyone really knows how large the number is. Probably the main cause, not probably, the main cause of car accidents. Just a little while ago at a Thousand Oaks where I live, there were five young people just finishing high school. They got their mother and their father's new Mercedes Benz, an E-Class. And they set out together. Five of those young kids were drunk. You know the biggest problem with our high schools and our colleges? Drunkenness. They went off the road, went into a tree. Five young people died because of the demon in the bottle. Will Congress say anything? The Senate say anything? No, because most of those people are drinking so much. I do not touch alcohol. I think it is a curse. Now, I think you probably have a fair idea where I stand now on alcohol and tobacco. I'm against them. And churches that condone those things don't love their people. Churches and ministers that condone alcohol and tobacco don't love their, their people because those things are killing their people. If you love people, you'll speak against those rotten things. Now the mental... Okay, we've looked at the physical, we've talked about the spiritual, we've just touched very lightly on the social, the mental. The mind has got a tremendous influence, the power of the mind. Ideas and thoughts can cause disease. Ideas and thoughts can heal the body. Come over here to Proverbs 14.30. Psalm, uh, Psalms, and then you come to Proverbs 14. Verse 30, the wise man says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Oh, we need peace in our hearts. Come to chapter 17, chapter 17, 20 to 22. Chapter 17, 20 to 22, the Bible says, A man of perverse heart does not prosper. He whose tongue is deceitful falls into trouble. To have a fool for a son brings grief. There is no joy for the father of a fool. A cheerful heart is good medicine, 
but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Listen to me. If you've got a cheerful heart, if you've got peace, if you've got joy, if you've got the joy of God in your heart, it's going to do something to your poor old body and it's going to be better than a shot of adrenaline. Mary Harder says in King James Version, does good like a medicine. Listen, the great destroyers, here they come. Fear. Come on, put them up. Fear, hate, anxiety, anger, resentment, guilt, depression. Have you got any reason to have any of those? Of course you do. We all have reason to be resentful and to feel angry on occasions, but you can't hold on to those things. You've got to give those things to God because these are the great destroyers. I want to give you just a couple of texts here. We won't have time to go through it all tonight. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 to 30. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What a beautiful text, verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's why I believe in the Sabbath. The Sabbath is divine rest for human restlessness. The Bible says if you and I will come to God, if we will get our sins forgiven, if we will make peace with our fellow men, if somebody's done something rotten to you and people are doing rotten things all the time, you know what you got to do? You got to forgive them. Is it hard to forgive somebody you don't like? Yeah, it's real hard. But Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. The Bible tells us, forgive. Peter said, how many times, Lord, do I have to forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus said, 70 times seven. <laughs> so the Bible teaches forgiveness. Taking the poison out of the heart and bringing it through to God. Now, I'm going to slip down to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. I'm going to miss out a text or two. And I'm going to come down to Psalm 23. And I want you to notice this text. It's a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful text. Psalm 23. You got it? Psalm 23. This is, this is wonderful. When this gets into the mind, the mind starts to do things when you've got love in your heart, when you've got mercy in your heart. The love of Jesus can change the mind and that changes the body. Here it is, Psalm 23. It's just the most wonderful, the most perfect Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You get that into your heart and see what it does for you. Years ago, I was running a big campaign in the great city of St. Petersburg. Perhaps one of the great, not perhaps, one of the greatest cities in the world. And uh, I was put into hospital. Uh, it was a pretty drab experience. It was tough. The hospitals had, they had no medicines or anything. They rushed me in there and going into a Russian hospital back in those days was almost a sentence to death. They looked after me well. The doctors were wonderful. The nurses were wonderful. But they put me on some medication and my blood pressure dropped so low that when they took it, read it, they said, you shouldn't be alive. So you know what I did? They said, don't move. I immediately got out of bed and started jogging. I said, I know how to get my blood pressure up. 
Either you make me mad or you let me jog. It'll go up either way. But I was there by myself alone. My family was nowhere around. I couldn't contact them. I couldn't contact my team. A little Russian girl who was uh, uh, there, I sent her out, get a taxi, get to the hotel, tell my folks to come because I'm in trouble. But I did something better than anything else. I got my Bible and I read this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That brought a peace into my heart. You can have that peace in your heart. There's no peace in the world, my friend. If you come to Christ and if you commit your life to Christ and if you turn from sin and if you're baptized and if you start to keep his commandments, you're going to have peace. 